Amen. Would you have your seat, keeping your finger open to 1 John, keep your finger open to 1 John. We are continuing our study through the, gospel, through the epistle of 1 John, a series entitled Love Out Loud, Love Out Loud. And we are going through a title today about making the right choices to enjoy this life that God has for us. And so we're going to be walking through 1 John. Now, I don't know about you, but since I've been studying the book of 1 John, my unconditional love has been, well, it's been being tested since we started reading this book. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, for me, even there was a lady in our church she came up to me after the first week of First John, and she said, you know, I was uh, walking with my husband, and I said something that wasn't so great about someone, and he said to me, wow, we're studying First John. There's an obvious problem. Well, now she's kind of become my own accountability because every time I talk negatively or think negatively about someone, I realize how far yet I have to go in order to be the person of love that I'm desiring to be. Now, I've got hope because you've got hope. How many of you have been struggling with some people since we've been starting First John? Like, <laughs> only one or two raise your hand. The rest of you, okay, there's another one. We've got some truthful people here this evening. Don't, you're in good company. No one in the morning service raised their hand. I had to harass them. So here's the deal. I'm the only one that's struggling with this. I get it, and I get to air my dirty laundry to all of you. Now, how many of you have been struggling with this whole love one another thing? Thank you, thank you. Here's the deal, we got hope, because John wrote this book. It's his second. The first was the Gospel of John. Now he's writing this epistle of John, and he's gonna write two more, Second John and Third John. But something has happened to John. You see, John, in the Gospels, he was known as the Son of Thunder. That wasn't such a great reputation. If you remember, he wanted to burn up an entire Samaritan village with all the people there in the village. But now, in 1 John, something's changed. He's become the apostle of love. The apostle of love. It amazes me about the Word of God. 
I was teaching at a men's retreat this past weekend, and uh, while I was teaching, um, I just spoke the Word of God. I simply read Scripture. I explained Scripture, and a man came to me afterwards, and he's weeping. And he's speaking about how the Word has affected his heart and how the Word has affected his life. And I'm sitting there listening to him confess his sin about being a husband or being a father and all the things that God was doing with him, and I was amazed at the power of the Word. I didn't do anything. I didn't do any magic tricks. I didn't have any lights or show. No, it was just a matter of preaching and teaching the Word of God and the power of the Word of God. Now, if you're wondering, that was a shameless plug for our men's retreat. So if you have not signed up, you need to sign up. Amen? Okay, the women were a little bit louder. (laughs) But it amazes me because the Word of God had changed John. Isn't this why Jesus said, follow me and I will make you? Isn't it why Paul could be confident that he who began a good work in you will complete that work? It's why John wrote his gospel. You see, look with me at the screen. It's John chapter 20, and I want to read to you what John wrote in regards to uh, this gospel. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, I have written these words to you, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John also knew the power of the Word of God. That's why he took the time to write down what Jesus said. It's why he explained to the first century world and passes all the way through now to the 21st century that Jesus is God, that he is divine, that he is deity, because John as well knew the power and the authority of the Word of God. But now in 1 John, Well, now in 1 John, we are 50 years into our faith. 50 years after the resurrection, now he's writing the first epistle to the church. And John says, I'm writing you this letter because I want to let you know something. Would you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 4? And we are writing these things so that our, or your joy, may be complete. John says this, I got some great things to tell you which are going to make you absolutely joyful. I mean, your your socks are going to be blown off when I tell you the truth. And here's the truth. Here's the message. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. Now, you might look at that and go, well, well, what does that mean? Well, it means he's the way, he's the truth, and the life. We talked about it last week. There's no shadows around Jesus. He is the light of heaven. He was the light at the beginning. He's the light of the world, and he will be the light for all of eternity. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. But now, 50 years into our faith, let me tell you what's going on. They need a little bit of joy. Because, let me explain, believers were realizing that people are not going to become perfect. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? People are not going to become perfect. Let me tell you another truth. (coughs) You are not going to be perfect. Amen? Oh, wow. Greater response than the first crowd. When I said the first one, that people are not perfect, they said, amen. When I said people are, uh, you are not perfect, they went, "Mm -hmm." But you guys are the honest group. You guys are the heavy hitters. And you as well realize, man, I'm in this thing just like these believers were in it. And they're knowing that God is light, but they're recognizing, wow, I got a little bit of darkness in me. I got things that need to change. And so John, what he does is he gives a series of choices. And we learned last week that he gave a choice in 1 John chapter 1. You can either be a hypocrite or you can be a disciple. We learned last week as well another choice that we can make. We can, learn, we can live in deception, or we can be honest about our struggle and call it what it is. But now in 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, he gives us another choice to make to walk in this joy. Now let me explain something to you. 
Before you see this and understand this choice, remember that John is asking you to make the choice because he wants you to have an abundant life. He's not keeping you from something. He's trying to give you something. And what is that choice? You can choose to be prideful or you can choose to be humble. You can choose to be prideful or you can choose to be humble. Look at verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, I accentuated the word him because John is trying to lovingly get across to those that are in sin, you need to change. He's making it clear that if someone confronts you with the word and they lovingly come to you and they say, you are wrong and you choose not to change, that you're not calling the person a liar. You don't have a problem with the person, the messenger. You're calling Jesus a liar because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you are doing something other than what God would direct you to do, then you are wrong and he is right. Now listen, your problem is not with the person that's confronting you. Your problem is with the righteous word of God. But let me explain something. This problem goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Do you remember our first couple, Adam and Eve? Well, Eve decided to eat the fruit. Adam was right there with her. He ate the fruit along with her. And now all of a sudden, they look at each other and go, <gasps> romance over, we are naked. We gotta do something. And they took the most designer fig leaves you can imagine and began to cover themselves with it. How scratchy and itchy must it have been, so much so that God slaughters one of his precious animals and covers them with leather so that they can walk out of the garden. But when God came into the garden, he said, where are you? Oh, not only did they cover themselves, they hid from God. And not only did they hide from God, when God found them, he knew exactly where they were. What happened? What did Adam say? It's the woman you gave me. What did the woman say? It's that snake you put in the garden. The snake goes, well, I ain't got no one else to blame. I'm the only one left here. And they did the blame game. They became the victim. It's not my fault. It's everyone else's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's the community's fault. It's the country's fault. It's California's fault. And instead of being and living in the victory that 1 John speaks about, our faith, we choose to live as a victim instead of allowing the Word of God to change our lives. Why not just admit I'm wrong? Why not just admit, I need to change? Adam and Eve, why would you hide? Why would you cover yourselves? Why would you blame? Because it's very difficult for us to say, I was wrong. So say it. Say it. I was wrong. One more time. I like how it sounds. Go ahead. Say it. Okay, it sounds a little bit louder over here. Not much going on on this section, okay? All right, so we're going to say it one more time. I just like to hear it. Go ahead. One more time. Wow, that makes me feel really great. Because by you all confessing that you're wrong, that makes me right. Now, none of us like that feeling, right? None of us like to say, I was wrong. None of us like to let those words come out of our mouth. In fact, some of you sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. It's nothing coming out of your mouth. It's just kind of like, well, I don't know if I can say that. I don't know if I can admit that. I don't know if I can be humble enough to say that I'm wrong. But that's the choice, isn't it? You see, you can choose to live in your pride at God's righteous standard and say, no, I'm right. Or you can choose in humility to say, I was wrong. That's exactly the choice that John is giving us. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
John is trying to get the point across, listen, why be prideful? Why not just admit you're wrong? Why not choose to be humble? Now he goes, listen, I'm writing you this whole book because I don't want you to sin, but because I know the plight of humanity, just in case you do sin, I got great news for you. All you have to do is be humble because Jesus paid the price of your sins. Look at verse 2. He says this, he, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation, I practiced that word for a week, for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John is looking and he's saying, listen, just be humble. Be humble enough to confess I'm wrong because I've already told you if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is making it clear we're gonna sin. It's why Jesus died. He died so that when we do sin, we can go to Jesus and ask him to forgive us by admitting I was wrong. I was wrong. And you're right. Because you're the righteous. That's your title. That's the title that John gives uh, Jesus. You are the righteous. You can do no wrong. You are never wrong. You are always right. You see, Jesus, he is the propitiation. Now, I'm not speaking in tongues. That's a real English word. And this word propitiation, it means doing something to gain the favor of another. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He did something. He paid the price of our sin, satisfying the debt of death for God so that we might be able to be with God for all of eternity. But not just for eternity, you guys. Remember, John is trying to give you joy. And by simply admitting to God, I'm wrong and you're right, John is trying to get across the point, you can experience and you can live in true joy. Now I need you to trust me in something. I don't know what your sin is. And I don't know why it's so difficult to say I was wrong. But I need to let you know, Jesus can handle it. He died for it. He died knowing that you would sin. Listen, John is writing to Christians Christians. And he's saying, believers, not only can Jesus forgive your sin, he can forgive the sin of the whole world. You can't get around the mercy of God. He wants to forgive you. All you have to do is come to him and confess your sin because he paid that debt. Now, let me communicate something here so important. Some Christians take advantage of this and they go out and they willfully sin. Oh, God will forgive me. Hey, I did it again. Please forgive me. Hey, I did it again. Hey, please forgive me. Hey, I did it again. Please forgive me. No, no, no. I have to then begin to doubt, do you really have Jesus in your heart and in your life? For this reason alone, would you look at Romans chapter 6? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. The New King James Version says, absolutely not. Am I going to take advantage of this great love of God? How can we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, if you're saved, then you're not going to be living in sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk. Underline this if you turn there. Put it in your notes. We too may walk in the newness of life. In the newness of life. You see, something happens to the believer when we get saved. I don't want to go to sin I don't want to rely on God's grace. I want to rely on God's grace to say no to ungodliness. I want to live for God because of what Christ has done for me. I'm so overwhelmed that he would do this for me that now I want to live in this great grace that God has for me. So what is this newness of life that I'm supposed to walk in? It's right there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. John describes what this newness of life is. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep 
his commandments. There's the newness of life. The newness of life is that we keep his commandments. Now, you remember the story. Jesus is being pummeled with questions. The scribes and the Pharisees are doing everything they can to denounce Jesus and his authority because they don't want to admit that he is right and they are wrong. And so this one lawyer comes on the scene having had listened to all the questions and he says, Jesus, I got a question for you and I want to know something. What is the greatest of the commandments? Now remember, John is describing the newness of life and he says in verse 3, and by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. And so this lawyer says, tell me the greatest commandment. And Jesus says this, hear, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, everyone, all of you Jews, all of the Israelites, I want you to listen to me. Hear, O Israel, listen to what I'm about to say. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to the great commandments. Listen to how we know that we know him. By loving God and by loving others. And so John is telling us, listen, you'll know that you're in by loving God. I'm going to want to obey his commandments because Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Loving others? Well, of course I love others. Look how much God has loved me. And because God is love and has shown me love, then out of me is going to come love because he is within me. So John gives us another choice. Do we want to obey these commands or not? It's right there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. He says this, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You see, it's our second choice for this evening. We can choose to be rebellious, or we can choose to be obedient. We can choose to be rebellious, or we can choose to be obedient. Listen to what he says there again in verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, rebellion is when you know what to do and choose not to do it. It's looking at the no trespassing sign and deciding to cross the line. It's knowing what not to do and choosing to do it. Now, I don't know if any of you had this kind of child, but I had a young boy son who I still have a, well, he's a much older son now, but when he was younger, I don't know what it was about outlets, but he loved them. He loved them. He loved to caress them and touch them. And I don't know if it was the two holes in the one, it looked like a smiley face, but it just called to his name and he would always want to just touch it, put his finger in it, put something in it. And we had to talk to him over and over and over again. And then sometimes he'd be sitting by the outlet and start calling his name. I don't know how it was so attractive. It's just a plate on a wall. And I would say, don't do it. And he would go like this. Anyone ever have that kind of child? Anyone? You say, don't do it. Thank you for your honesty. You, you, you have this child, like, and he's just putting his hand out there. Well, I'll never forget my little brother. My little brother loved to finger paint with the contents in his diaper. And no matter how many times my mom disciplined him, no matter how many times they would say, don't do this, no matter how many times they would say, you can't do this, and he, there he is, this little toddler, every single morning, every single day after nap, he would, my mom would walk in, and there was a new drawing on the wall. There was all over the crib, all over the floor. There was contents of diaper everywhere. Now, some of you are looking at me, I cannot believe at church you're talking about the contents of a diaper. I can't believe that you're telling this story of your brother. And that's ridiculous. Why would anyone play with the contents of their diaper? How many of us have our own diapers that we play with? Now, you're laughing 
because you're laughing at my story of my brother and I can't believe that he would play with the contents of the diaper. Imagine God's point of view when he watches you play with the contents of your diaper. Now, I don't know what's in your diaper and I don't know what you're playing with. But imagine just for a moment from God's perspective, he's telling you the right way to go and you say, no, I want to go this way. And God looks on, he goes, it's the contents of a diaper. It's going to get you dirty. What in the world are you doing playing with that when I've got paint that you can use? Why would you choose to go this direction? Don't you know I'm the righteous? Don't you know that my way is right? Why would you choose to go inside that mess when I've got something so great for you. you. See, Proverbs tells us that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. But adults, believers who've walked with the Lord, are supposed to be mature and not play with diapers. Now you've got to remember John is talking to the Gnostics, and we talked about these guys before. You see, these guys, they said, well, we know Jesus. We, we've got a special knowledge, and we're so good, and we're so high, and we're so mighty. We can't believe that you would play with a diaper. I can't believe that you would mess around with that. And John is meeting, talking to them, saying, listen, you guys say you have a special knowledge. You say that you know Jesus, but your lifestyle doesn't match what you're communicating. And they would walk around and they would go, well, look at that person playing with a diaper. And look at that person playing with a diaper. Well, I'm just thankful to God that we're not like that. Christian, we've got to be careful that we don't become modern day Gnostics. We've got to be careful that when the world is playing with their diaper, we don't go look at them. Look at them finger painting with the contents of their diaper. I can't believe it. Can I remind us we used to do it? You see, we're not called to be the moral police. We are called to love. They're never going to know the truth of Scripture unless we love them to it. I'm not talking about embracing their sin. I'm talking to them about loving despite their sin so that we can win them over to the truth and then give them the truth so that they can change just like you and me. Remember what John wrote. He said in this own text, I'm writing these things to you because I want you to have fellowship. I'm not pointing out your dirty diapers. I'm not telling you and giving you these choices because I'm trying to point you wrong. I'm trying to give you an abundant life, a joy-filled life. So John makes it clear. You can't say you know him and you're not following the greatest command. You can't say you know him and you're not loving God. You're not loving others. It makes you a liar. Look at this word, what he says. He says in verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, we read the word no four times. If you say you know him, if you say you know him, if you say you know him, and this word no is not no by title, this word no is no by character. Uh, take a look at this scripture. It's Luke chapter 4. I want to describe the difference of these two different kinds of no's. It's Luke chapter 4, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, okay? Demon came to church, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You see, the demons, they only knew Jesus by title. They weren't following Jesus. But this no is not a no by title. That's a demonic way of knowing Jesus. This no is I know your character. I know your being. 
I know your conduct. I know your behavior. Jesus, I know you. I've been baptized. I've been immersed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I don't want to just know you by title and come into church and raise my hands and walk out and live any kind of life I want to live. No, because of the love of God that you have poured on me, I want to come into church as an expression of the life that I'm living outside of this place. And that's the final choice, isn't it? You can choose to be obedient. You see, he makes a contrast in verse 5, and he says there, but whoever keeps his word, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we're in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Yes, this is John's testimony. Right there in verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, God is going to be perfected in you. He's saying, I know this to be true. I was the son of thunder. God's word made impact in my life, and now I'm changed. Now I'm the apostle of love. Now I'm completely different. I know the value of obeying the Word of God. This is my testimony. I'm trying to get a message across to you. Now, for most of us, this change doesn't happen overnight. No, he says there in the last line, walk in the same way in which he walked. Whoever says he abide in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is a a word known as sanctification. We learn it, we live it. We learn it, and we live it. Paul, when he was writing the church, he said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He said this. The slide before, there we go. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. In other words, from glory to glory, step by step. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Next slide. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart, but we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Here's what Paul says unashamedly. I want to live a walk of faith, and I'm going to take one glory step and I'm going to take another glory step, and I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to live it. And each and every day, I'm going to go from point A to point B because I am growing step by step. I am growing faith by faith. I am choosing to walk in him. Peter also changed. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, and this is where we close. Just turn over a page, 2 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see the walk of faith. Walk of faith, it's found in 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read this step-by-step journey to grow in our faith. For this very reason, verse 5, make every effort, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith or to add to your faith virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, Self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. I want you to see this step by step. We can choose to be obedient. He says, take the first step of faith. Receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Then I want you to take the next step. It's called virtue. You're going to be so overwhelmed that you're saved, your devotion, your value will be in pleasing God. And then I want you to take the next step. It's called knowledge. I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's why you're here at church. I want you to hunger and thirst for righteousness so that you can learn how to be more like him. And then I want you to take another step and add self-control. Because as you learn more about who he is, you're saying goodbye to yourself. I'm going to live in the spirit. And when the self wants to take over, you exhibit self-control. And then I want you to take another step. 
steadfastness, because this is a marathon. Some days you will be running, some days you'll be running back. Some days you'll take a step forward, some days you'll take 10 steps back. And he says, I'm with you, I can forgive you, just keep moving steadfastly. And then we take another step, godliness. Godliness is a lifelong pursuit of becoming more and more like him. And the next step is brotherly affection, and all of a sudden, we begin to change the way we look at people. No longer like the Gnostics who look down on people for playing with their dirty diapers. No, this is someone who now looks at someone and says, I was there, but I know a joy that you don't have. And then finally, this next step, love. It's the bond to perfection. It holds everything together. And church, John is letting us know something. When we make these righteous right choices, following the righteous, there's a joy that's going to be expressed in our life like no other before. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do thank you for your word again and again. We praise you that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And we ask you now in the name of Jesus that you minister your grace to us. We pray, Lord, we pray that we would make right choices. You don't love us in pieces. You've given us everything, and I pray our return would be to give you everything. I pray, Lord, that we'd be a church like a city on a hill known for our love. Our love for each other and our love for the people in this world. Help us, God, take this word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us and close in worship?